Hi everyone. I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about an artist who is very inspirational, at least to me, and his name is Constantin Brancusi. He's inspirational because he came from very, very humble beginnings, but he managed to work hard, practice what he believed in, and in his lifetime was in fact one of the most famous sculptors of all time. He's a 20th century artist, so we could consider him to be a modernist, but he also has elements to his work that are timeless. So as we work through the slides, I'm going to show you, I want you to think about a man who lived, yes, at a very particular point in history, who lived in a very particular place on the European continent, who was limited in his lifetime by poverty, and by other dreadful circumstances, and yet strove to make his mark, quite literally, in the surface and fabric of culture. The easiest way I can talk about him is not just to show you images of work he made, but also to read from a book of my daughter's that she's kindly lent me. And it's this book, Stories for Kids Who Dare to Be Different, and in there, there are all kinds of different people who are brilliant for one reason or another in their own field. And Constantin Bercuzzi is in there. So I'm going to read it for you and this is what it says. Constantin grew up in the tiny village of Hobita in Romania. His parents were poor peasant farmers. And from the age of seven, Constantin was expected to look after the sheep. He'd spend his time carving chunks of wood he found on the ground. Now I want you to think about that. Here's a young boy who knows no different than shepherding. But any time he found something lying around that could be whittled or transformed through his creative hand, he would change it, he would sculpt it, he would use it and make it something of his own. Constantine was always being bullied by his brothers and his father. They were really horrible to him. And he often ran away. So at the age of seven, he was running away from home frequently, but he always ended up having to come back because he had no money and he had no way of making his way in the world at such a young age. But when he was 11, he managed to run away for good. In the city of Craiova, Constantin survived by doing whatever jobs he could. Now I want you to think, at age 11, the jobs that a young boy can do may be quite limited. He wasn't educated, he didn't come from money, he wasn't well connected. And so he worked as a grocer, he worked sometimes even as a fortune teller. And he also worked serving drinks in a cafe. But the thing that was really, really important to this little piece of history is that he also managed to take a course in woodworking. And what happened there was that he honed the skills he'd already started learning as a child, that he'd started to learn as part of an instinct, an instinct that he wanted to work with the fabric of things. When he was 18, Constantin made a violin out of scrap pieces of wood that he just found lying around. And a very wealthy benefactor saw it and was stunned by it, really impressed by it. And this patron paid for Constantin to attend the National Art School in Bucharest. So again, I want you to imagine that as a young man aged 18 with no formal education, really having clawed his way to any kind of um, position in the arts and crafts world. Here he was noticed by a very wealthy person who offered to pay for him to learn his craft properly. And so off he went to Bucharest. But after he graduated, he didn't want to stay there. He had his sights set on bigger things. And I think this is something that marks Brancusi throughout his life, is that he really did have ambition. And sometimes we scorn ambition, that we think of it as selfish. But actually in his case, ambition was simply about expression 
the knowledge that he couldn't stay in Bucharest, he couldn't stay as a shepherd and truly express the art he believed was within him. And so when he went from college, he walked 2,000 kilometres all the way to Paris, where he knew other great artists would be. And when he was there, he focused entirely on sculpting. Constantine carved by hand wood, stone, metal, anything really. Um, and his creations were inspired by myths, by folk tales, by ancient cultures and civilizations. Um, most famously, he was very, very interested in large oval heads that he could um, carve out of stone or smelt and create out of precious metals like gold. Um, he's also famous for sleek, shimmering birds in flight. And lots of these things are very, very abstract. And they were heavily criticised at the time. So Constantine sculpted things the way he felt. And the way he felt those things felt, not the way they looked necessarily. But luckily, because of the time in which he lived, there were so many other things happening in art that pushed the boundary of what was expected from artists. You will all know that in art history, traditionally a painting would be made to look like the thing it was portraying. But by the time Brancusi came along and some of his contemporaries, like Picasso for example, they no longer needed to just focus on the way things looked to the eye. They wanted to see how things looked to the spirit or to the heart. Anyway, some critics said that Constantine's sculptures were too abstract. They were too abstract. People didn't understand them. But Constantine, not just ambitious, but also actually very self-assured, thought otherwise. He didn't agree with them. And he had the guts to say, well, even if you don't like what I do, I like what I do. To Constantine, what was most real about something was the idea or the suggestion of it, not the accurateness of its appearance. Once Romania became a communist country, interestingly, he never wanted to go back. And he never did. But what he did do was he tried to leave his work to the government when he died. And he told them that this was going to happen and they refused it. They didn't want it. It was too different, too strange, too abstract. But funnily enough, when he came, became really, really famous all over the world, the government in Romania did in fact realise that they should have something to celebrate Brancusi and they've spent all these years trying to raise the money to buy back many of his sculptures. They're trying to raise 11 million dollars needed to buy a single piece by the boy shepherd from Hobita. Now I think that's a fascinating story. It's a story of courage, of diligence, of focus, and also of self-belief. But above all, it's part of the story of art. Thanks for listening.